We'll begin with Paul's graphical description of people at the end of time. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. During my high school days, I remember doing a chemistry experiment where we supersaturated a solution with a salt. The salt was completely invisible, dissolved by the water. But when we added just one tiny amount of ingredient, suddenly the salt crystallized out. What had been invisible, hidden, completely dissolved in the solution, quickly became visible to all. We live in a society supersaturated with social justice ideas. And although these ideas are everywhere, in many ways they are invisible, absorbed by our society. It's my hope that some thought in this presentation can crystallize out our understanding of social justice. And we can see it clearly and examine it biblically in the context of emotional intelligence. When I was 10 years old, I read an article reporting on research, surprising research that was found by the well-known General Electric psychometrician Johnson O'Connor. O'Connor found that simply studying vocabulary increased your IQ. He also found that a person's vocabulary level was the best single predictor of vocational success. Reading that article changed my view of vocabulary and definitions. After reading the article, I decided that words were my friends. And ever since, I've loved expanding my vocabulary and learning word definitions. So, in an effort to increase our uh, combined IQ and vocational success, this presentation will begin with definitions starting with the word emotion. The new Oxford American Dictionary defines emotion as, quote, a natural instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or relationship with others, instinctive or intuitive feelings as distinguished from reasoning or knowledge. The same source also gives synonyms for emotion, feeling, sentiment, reaction, response, instinct, intuition, the heart. The English language contains a lot of words used to describe emotions. One researcher found more than 300 words for emotions. On the screen is just a short list of some more common words for our varying feelings, but there are many others. I highlighted a few of the feelings most of us have experienced at some time in our lives. Anger, disgust, embarrassment, fear, loneliness, love, regret, sadness, shame. Notice how the dictionary contrasts the heart with the head. We're not simply reasonable and logical beings. We have feelings. Computers can be given logic. They can even use this logic to detect emotions in human voices. But no one has found a way to give computers emotions. It doesn't appear that we'll need IT psychologists to treat robots with emotional problems anytime soon. The head contains knowledge, facts, logic, and reason which make up our thoughts. To some extent, some of these functions can be computerized. The heart holds our desires, purposes, motives, feelings, inclinations, and intentions. Machines and artificial intelligence lack this. IQ is one's ability to recall, organize, and creatively utilize information, knowledge, and facts using logic and reason. EQ, or emotional intelligence, is the measure of our ability to control our emotions versus their power to control us. We have all experienced mental battle battles between our thoughts and feelings, our head versus our heart. We could even divide the people in the world into two groups. Those whose thoughts control their emotions, high EQ, and those whose emotions control their thoughts, low EQ. EQ is not about how brilliant our mind is or how high our IQ may be. 
Instead, it is about our head's ability to take charge of our feelings. Head and heart are not independent from each other. They're tightly linked. Thoughts produce actions, words, memories, experiences, which in turn color and trigger our emotions. But our emotions, in turn, produce actions, words, memories, and experiences, and trigger thoughts. As we repeat this cycle over time, we develop habits of thoughts, and habits are linked with habits of feeling. Habits are powerful because they are virtually automatic and effortless. They are seldom changed and then only with a great deal of effort. Our habitual patterns of thinking and feeling make up our character, and character is who we are. This is important because our character determines our destiny. We've looked at the operational definition of EQ as the measurement of our, our ability to control our emotions versus their power to control us. Here is the dictionary's formal definition of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is, and I quote, the capacity to be aware of, control, and express one's emotion and to handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathetically. Before we look at social justice, we need to understand justice. West's definitive legal dictionary, the Encyclopedia of American Law, defines justice as the proper administration of the law. Of course, that raises the question, what is proper? And so the definition continues. The fair and equitable treatment of all individuals under the law. In other words, justice is the impartial and proportionate enforcement of good laws. When you have good laws, impartially and proportionately enforced, you have justice. You cannot separate justice from law. They're linked. When law is good, its impartial and proportionate enforcement is good. A just society impartially and proportionately enforces good laws. The Bible clearly supports justice. The Lord is a God of justice, Isaiah says. Solomon said, to do justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Christ does not accept church going as a substitute for law keeping and impartial and proportional law enforcement. At the close of Jesus' ministry, he called out hypocritical religious practices. He said, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, peace, and faith. You ought to give a tenth, but without forgetting about those more important matters. In the Bible, justice is bound to God's law and is extremely important in Christian thought. Paul, the greatest evangelist of Christianity, said of God's end-time justice, He will give justice with blazing fire to those who don't recognize God and don't obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. God's justice, biblical justice, is God's impartial and proportional enforcement of his Ten Commandment law. This is not, however, the meaning or definition of the word justice in the phrase social justice. Let's look at the meaning of the phrase social justice. The Oxford Dictionary defines social justice as justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, the distribution of opportunities, and in the distribution of privileges within a society. While specifics vary, social justice is generally used at a minimum encompasses these three areas, wealth, opportunities, and privileges. It is important to notice that social justice, as it has come to be understood today, is not linked to impartial and proportional enforcement of good law. Because social justice is not tied to impartial and proportional enforcement of good law, the word justice is actually a misnomer. Social justice is not about justice for all. Rather, it is about perceived unfairness for some. The F.A., the late F.A. Hayek, an influential European economist and Nobel laureate, pointed out that social justice is opposed to actual justice. 
since social justice opposes treating all individuals impartially and is itself promoting inequality and injustice for some. Although Wikipedia is not an academic source, it often reflects the view of those who are particularly passionate about a topic. Here is the Wikipedia's description of social justice. It summarizes it as a concept of fair and just relations between the individual and society. Social justice makes the claim of standing for fairness and against injustice. Once again, we see social justice is all about perceived unfairness and injustice. But how is fairness measured? The definition continues. Fairness is measured by the explicit and tacit terms for the distribution of wealth, opportunities for personal activity, and social privileges. We see the equitable distribution of the same three areas, wealth, opportunities, and privilege. However, social justice has no objective standard, so there is no agreement on what is fair. Schemes for equitable distribution of wealth opportunities and social privileges differ widely. An excerpt from Tristan Rogers' essay, Justice is Lawless Lawfulness, illustrates such differences. Political philosophers like Philippe Van Perutz have worried about such trivial matters as whether surfers ought to be subsidized for what Ronald Dworkin calls expensive tastes, which they have blamelessly developed yet unfairly bear the burden of financing. Or there is the issue raised by G.A. Cohen of whether one can support eg egalitarian policies while remaining wealthy oneself. And most egregiously, Adam Swift asks, can we be partial to our own children and remain faithful to the cause of social justice? As we have seen, social justice is tied to the emotions. In an article promoting social justice and activism, Luther Nauer Ministries describes social justice as, as being about feeling as valuable as other people. But this is an illusionary goal. What will make a person feel as valuable as other people? And if we could make one person feel as valuable as other people, would it all make all people feel similarly valuable? Or could the very process of making one person feel as valuable as other people make other people feel less valuable? And d if we did manage to make another person feel as valuable as other people, would that feeling persist? Like waves, feelings come, feelings go. Anchoring our lives to feeling is like trying to anchor a boat to a wave. As we've already seen, the word feeling is a synonym for emotion. The statement continues, being treated differently feels wrong. But does it really feel wrong for a baby to be treated differently than a 32-year-old? The article added some magical thinking with mind reading that deep down people know it isn't fair to receive better or worse treatment without earning it. What objective standard determines whether or not we have earned the treatment we receive? As used today, the phrase social justice is all about emotions and feelings, feelings and fairness. Social justice, with its focus on unfairness, injustice, and lack of rights, is integrally associated with revolutionary movements, some politicians and political platforms, much of the media, much of Holly Hollywood with its worldwide influence, universities and accreditation, which has significant implications for the future beliefs of society. Interestingly, several Supreme Court justices sometimes make key decisions based not on the Constitution, but on social justice theory. Social justice is foundational for such movements as feminism, LGBT, socialism, and communism. Let's examine some further differences between justice and so-called social justice. The primary focus of justice is the individual, while the primary focus of social justice is the group. It is social, after all. The primary concern of justice is an observable action or behavior. The primary concern of social justice is outcome often attempted with a <coughs> associated with an attempt to assign a motive and label it. Justice is measured by a standard, the law. Social justice is me measured against fairness that is generally defined as equality of wealth, possession, and privilege, though sometimes other items are added. The basis for justice 
is objective, the law. The, defini the definition of object objective is a standard not influenced by personal feeling. The basis for social justice is subjective. And the definition of subjective is a standard based on feeling. Justice is thoughtful. On the other hand, social justice is emotional, that is controlled by feeling. And that's, a very, that's the very definition of low emotional intelligence, controlled by emotions. This means social justice warriors are easily triggered. Think about it for a moment. This also means they can be easily manipulated. Let's pause to illustrate the difference between justice and social justice. Suppose an individual has some money. It might be a lot or it might be only a little. Justice is not concerned with the money an individual has as long as it was obtained lawfully. An individual might receive it from an inheritance or from a spouse. An individual might have earned it by hard work, good management, wise investment, or good fortune. It doesn't matter how much or how little as long as it was obtained lawfully. If it was obtained unlawfully through theft or other crime, the action or behavior of the individual is then judged by the law. If it was, uh, uh, furthermore, as long as the money is spent or saved lawfully, justice is not concerned about the use of the money. Of course, if it, of course, if it is spent unlawfully. For example, to bribe a judge, to hire a hitman, or purchase illegal drugs, justice would be concerned about the illegal action or behavior. This is in marked contrast to social justice, which is concerned with the wealth of an individual compared to a group. Social justice would be concerned about whether it was fair to have the wealth or the poverty. It may ask the question about whether the individual was deserving of the money. As previously mentioned, social justice seeks to evaluate the motives and label them. But these cannot be determined with certainty, for they are easily denied, disguised, and hidden. God's justice can consider motivation, but human justice does not consider motivation because it can't. It's knowable only to God. We can guess, we can surmise, we can't know. Human justice can only examine the actions. Robin Hood may, like Judas, claim to be concerned with the poor when he robs the rich. To social justice, this makes Robin Hood a hero. Justice asks only about the action. Did he rob? To justice, Robin Hood is simply a thief. On the other hand, social justice often assigns a label with an associated motive. There are such current favorites as insensitive, racist, sexist, misogynistic, patriarchal, or the perennial favorite, judgmental. All, of course, are judgmental. Anytime a motive is, as is assigned, including being judgmental, that's judgmental. What are the consequences of each system? Justice is a system that encourages individual responsibility by holding individuals accountable for their actions. Social justice removes individual responsibility by blaming others for inequalities. This makes vis victims instead of masters. Blame and victimization removes trust. Blame and victimization brings dissatisfaction, discontent, complaining, and unhappiness. Instead of being a problem solver, social justice is a problem causer. We've seen that justice is integral to Christianity, but what does social justice have to do with Christianity? We'll briefly look at two intersecting areas. First, social justice is often defended by the claim that Christianity is a religion of social justice. For example, Justin Steckbauer, author and the founder of Life of Peace, writes, we see that justice ministry is an important subsector sector of the historic Christian church and an important teaching in the pages of the Bible. And Jesus, the founder of Christianity, is frequently called a social activist. For example, Leo Yu, a social justice activist with the Hugh Foundation states that Jesus was a radical social activist who died fighting for justice and the common good. And then he adds, when I look around and see rising poverty and in inequality, sexism, racism, religious persecution, and environmental destruction, 
I pray for the courage that I lack to be a radical social activist like Jesus. We could multiply such statements. Social justice is also said to be a biblical issue. On the screen is one such quote from a megachurch senior pastor and author in Jacksonville, Florida. Social justice is also said to be included in the gospel Christians are commanded to preach to the world. Influential Southern Baptist teacher, leader, Nathan Lorick says that social justice issues are a part of the gospel. There's a second aspect to be considered regarding social justice and Christianity. Major Christian churches are dividing over social justice. I've only listed a few prominent churches such as Baptist, Catholic, Presbyterian, and Methodist that are experiencing deepening schism over this issue. We'll examine the truth of the claim that social justice is founded on biblical Christian principles and its relation to emotional intelligence. The history of the phase phrase social justice is interesting. Digitalization of the world's English literature has made it possible to search virtually the entire corpus of English documents. According to the Wikipedia, the first known time the phrase is found is in the Federalist Papers. In the context, the phrase meant justice for a society. It had nothing to do whatsoever with the modern definition. The phrase was an Italian phrase popularized during the European revolutions of 1848, and interestingly, the meaning of the phrase has evolved over time. It began to morph into its present meaning around the turn of the 20th century when it was promoted and popularized by labor unions and subsequently by feminist activists, then progressive civil rights activists, and most recently LGBT activists. Though the term itself may be relatively recent, the concept and philosophy of social justice is ancient. After the children of Israel escaped from the Egyptian bondage, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. During the first year, the wilderness sanctuary was constructed, and then at the start of the second year, the sanctuary service was inaugurated. The sanctuary service introduced major changes in Israelite worship. Service in the sanctuary was limited to the descendants of Levi. The priesthood itself was reserved exclusively for the descendants of Aaron. Obviously, there was neither opportunity nor privilege equality, and many of the Hebrews resented this. Leaders from the eldest son of Jacob, the Reubenites, were upset. They were not alone. Leaders of the other tribes felt disenfranchised. These, leader, these worship changes were unpopular with the majority of the Israelites who felt that the decision was exclusive and nepotistic. One of the Levites, Korah, led out in an insurrection early in the children of Israel's, Israel's wanderings. Joined by nearly all of Israel, Korah demanded opportunity and privilege equality for all of Israel. Korah and his father, followers, and I quote, gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? God gave no sympathy to these disaffected Israelites. After they refused to repent and accept his offer of pardon, God sent a very directed sinkhole which swallowed up and buried the leaders. And subsequently, when Korah's followers also refused to repent and accept God's offer of pardon, God sent a plague that took the lives of those who remained sympathetic to Korah's social justice movement. The Bible says that Korah and his followers' desire for equity in opportunity and privilege was a display of jealousy and envy. Psalm 106.16, they were jealous of Moses in the camp and of Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord. In this passage, the Hebrew word can be translated as either of the Siamese twins, envy or jealousy. Since English uses two separate words to encompass this one Hebrew word, some translations use the word jealousy, while other translations use the word envious. Jealous and envious. The King James Version translates it as envy. They envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. Of course, both translations are correct. Instead of translating it one or the other, it would actually be most correct to translate the passage as they were jealous and envious. The relationship of jealousy and envy 
to social justice is widely recognized. In his book, Egalitarian Envy, The Political Foundations of Social Justice, the late author, Gonzalo Fernandez de la Mora, called social justice collective envy and warned that Western societies were being shaped by politicians stoking flames of envy to gain power and control. We, see, we have seen that social justice has nothing to do with justice, but social justice has nothing to do with social either. John Stuart Mill described envy as the most antisocial of all pas pa passions. Dr. Rhodes Boyson referred to social justice as a synonym for the creation of envy. It is not without reason that Kenneth Hudson, in his book, The Dictionary of Diseased English, calls social justice a meaningless phrase. Even many of those promoting social justice recognize that it is based on envy, but often seek to rationalize this envy as what they refer to as excusable envy. In his book on the genealogy of morality, Friedrich Nietzsche wrote, all men of resentment, are these physiologically distorted and worm-ridden persons, a whole quivering kingdom of burrowing revenge, indefagable and insatiable in its outbursts against the happy, and equally so in disguises for revenge and pretexts for revenge? When will they really reach their final, fondest, most sublime triumph of revenge? At that time, doubtless, when they succeed in pushing their own misery, indeed all misery there is, into the consciousness of the happy, so that the latter begin one day to be ashamed of their happiness, and perchance say to themselves when they meet, it's a shame to be happy, there too there's too much misery. <laughs> feelings of misery and, and feelings of jealousy and envy are very strong negative emotions. The Hebrew word which combines these two English words is, is right, for where you have the one, you will always have the other. Jealousy is the feeling that I do not receive the appreciation, recognition, or possessions that I deserve and believe I deserve. Envy is the feeling that another is receiving appreciation, recognition, or possession that I desire and believe I deserve. Feelings of jealousy and envy change the way we look at things. Like looking through an imperfect lens, jealousy and envy distorts our thoughts and makes us feel abused and mistreated even if we're not. It makes us suspicious of others' motives and actions. The feeling of being mistreated and abused triggers a cascade of other strong emotions against perceived unfairness and injustice, which produce hatred, anger, malice. Malice is the desire for revenge, the desire for another to be hurt, wishing ill or less than the best on another. Malice makes people feel justified, satisfied, even righteous for slander, revenge, robbery. Murder. Malice is something that must be left behind. The New Testament is clear that these negative emotions are not part of the Christian life. This is a distinct and unequivocal evidence that an individual has truly become a Christian because these are not part of their life. Freedom from these controlling emotions is one of the great gifts that Christianity offers Notice how Paul describes this. For we ourselves were, once, were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. He thought back to his own life before he became a Christian and the change that Christ had brought to his life. He thought of the dramatic changes he had witnessed in the lives of those to whom he was writing. He was writing a letter to friends he loved and knew well. He remembered, and they too remembered their lives before Christianity. But this statement is just as true for every Christi Christian who has ever lived. First, the emotion of envy and jealousy takes away common sense, good judgment, and wisdom. These emotions cloud and control the thinking and decisions. They produce behavior that's irrational and self-destructive. In a word, these motions make us foolish. And they also lead us to reject, disregard, despise, and disobey God's law of love, disobedient. But perhaps the worst problem with such emotions is that they make us lie to ourselves. 
cause us to justify and defend such emotions and the actions that flow out of them. These emotions can so control us that we come to think we're right when we couldn't be more wrong. Like a virus infecting our physical heart with a viral carditis, these viral emotions infect our mental heart with a, a uh, emotional cart, um, an emotional itis. We even lose the ability to recognize that we are controlled by envy, hate, and malice. We become so deceived that we come to believe and defend such emotions as proper, even for Christians. And this is the common lot of humanity. Paul goes on to say that the salvation that Christianity offers us frees us from bondage to these viral emotions. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Paul says that Christ saves us from these damaging emotions and washes them away, leaving healthy, positive emotions in their place through the healing process of the Holy Spirit. Peter says something similar to Paul. He also has a before we become Christians and an after we, we become Christians. Peter's before, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. Peter says that this is one of the first changes that occurs in the life of the in, when the individual becomes a Christian. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. As the Christian lays aside every particle of these evil emotions, the emotions of the heart are healed. There's a reason why God dealt quickly and severely with jealousy and envy. Had God not intervened with these judgments, Israel would have quickly disintegrated. Jealousy and envy are like a cancer that kills the organism. Like cancer, these must be detected early and eradicated fully. Jealousy and envy follow a completely predictable social pattern. They produce dissatisfaction, discontent, rivalry, and bitterness. The envious and jealous can't help but talk about their discontent to others to gain sympathy. False sympathy then creates a party spirit with division, schism, institutional instability, whether the institution is a home, a school, a church, or a country. The fruit of social justice is riots, rebellions, and war. You may have seen the news this week how social justice does so social justice just caused a division among, listen to this, quilters. Yes, quilters. It'll divide any group. In a Sermon on the Mount, Christ told his disciples to evaluate claims of the lip by fruit in the life. And so we can understand how to inspect fruit Paul gives us a list of the fruit of the Spirit and the contrasting list of the fruit of the flesh. And the fruit of the flesh includes hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions. And when we see any of this fruit ripening, we know it's fruit of the flesh and we can know it's from an evil tree we must avoid. There's a stark contrast between social justice and Christianity. Jealousy and envy is the fuel for social justice. Without jealousy and envy, there is no social justice movement. So social justice justifies and excuses these evils, promotes them. Bible-based Christianity, on the other hand, does not con condone jealousy or envy and Christ purifies this from the Christian's life. Christianity elevates our emotional intelligence by banishing these emotions that would otherwise seize control of our lives. By contrast, social justice de decreases the emotional intelligence by decreasing our so self-control and fanning these emotions that then control us. That's why a society filled with social justice ideas will always be easily triggered and outraged. Social justice is also an outgrowth of covetousness. Covetousness is the desire for that which belongs to another. Covetousness grows into the feeling that something belonging to another rightly belongs to me. 
covetousness is intrinsic to any system of modern social justice. Coveting is a crime against God's law which ends with the command, thou shalt not covet. Jesus warned of this danger and said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. The Apostle Paul said, for the love of money is the root of all evil. The great problem in the world is not lack of money, but love of money. And more money does not bring less love of money. Thus, social justice does not, cannot fix the root of the evil, but actually increases it. While some, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. Coveting is a departure from the faith. And pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Christianity saves us from the many sorrows the love of money with coveting brings. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Christ in the life brings us contentment, for with him we have everything we need. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Covetousness is the father of falsehood, theft, robbery, fraud. Social justice provides a justification for committing such actions. But there's injustice in the world. There's inhumanity of man toward man. There's mistreatment and abuse. If social justice is not the Bible's answer, what is the Bible's answer to injustice, abuse, cruelty, and mistreatment? First, the Bible instructs us on our individual responsibility. Share your bread with the humble, with the hungry. This was Jesus' example. I like how my favorite commentary on the life of Christ put it. To those who were in need, he would give a cup of cold water and would quietly place his own meal in their hands. Bring the poor and homeless into your house. Clothe the naked when you see them and not to ignore your own flesh and blood. And this is the New Testament mandate. Paul tells us this differentiates a believer from a non-believer. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Notice how Jesus expands Isaiah's list. This is such an essential for Christians that Christ says it differentiates the saved from the lost, the sheep, that are saved from the goats that are lost. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, these are the sheep, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for me from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked you cl- and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. James repeats this instruction from his younger stepbrother Jesus. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I was in prison, you came to me. Notice Jesus doesn't call for us to organize a mass demonstration against the government for abusing their authority, imprisoning innocent Christians for their faith. Neither does it say to get out guns and use force to free those unjustly held for following Jesus. Moses' slaying of the abusive Egyptian was an unrighteous murder. Jesus didn't commend Peter for attempting to defend him from the unjust and cruel capture by using his sword to chop off the high priest's servant ear. Jesus did not lead demonstrations, use force, or even a miraculous power to free John the Baptist from his dungeon, and John was unjustly executed. This angered the social justice activists in his day, such as Judas, who wanted more milit- militant action. But courageously visiting, encouraging, and cheering Christians who are in prison for their faith is what Christians are to do. A great sin was committed by those early Christians in Rome for failing to visit Paul. He says, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. He forgave them, as he adds, may it not be charged against them. Secondly, Christianity teaches a strong work ethic. When banishing Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, God told them, in the sweat of your faith, 
face, you shall eat bread. Paul applies God's command to Christians. We, are command, we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. There's no place in Christianity for lazy freeloaders. Those individuals capable of working need to work. There's a third important biblical teaching. Trust God through times of undeserved abuse, difficulty, or loss. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. This is a very important point for Christians to understand. Paul tells us all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If we never are rejected, ridiculed, abused, we have no evidence we are really Christians. The greatest persecution of Christians in the history of the world is just ahead. But through it all, we can trust in God's sovereignty. Jesus' scars from the abuse and the cruelty he suffered. But these memorials of Satan's cruelty are now monuments to his glory. He has rays flashing from his hand, and there's the hiding of his power. If you have scars from the abuse you've suffered, he has promised to make them glorious. He will give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And that brings us to the fourth and final point that we'll have time to make in this presentation. Christianity recognizes and appreciates that God loves variety and gives variety. Nature teaches us this. Paul reminds us there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. As it is in the physical, so it is in the spiritual. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. In Christ's parable of the talents, Jesus makes God's plan of life clear. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. Social justice ends in a drab sameness. Communism reveals what the triumph of social justice looked like with its gray concrete housing throughout Moscow. But nothing can make it equal. Even in communist Moscow, some had apartments at the top of buildings, others on the ground floor, each having its own set of privileges and opportunities. Feminism and its daughter in the LGBTQ movement seeks to remove all gender distinctions and abolish the differences that God made when he created man, male, and female. We are not replaceable parts in God's system. When I tell my wife, you're the only one in the world, I'm telling her the truth. And in the history of the world, there has never been another like Sherry. My love and appreciation for her is different in quantity and quality from my love and appreciation for anyone else. It is our uniqueness that gives us our value. The equality sought by social justice warriors reduces the value of the individual. The equality sought by social justice warriors is also a mirage. Diamonds are not the same as rubies and nothing else will make them the same. We're all different. With God given differences at birth, we have different heights, strengths, interests, and abilities. We have different ages, different likes. Talents, opportunities, privileges, and resources are different by God's design. Associated with the poverty of the post-Civil post War recession, the Greenback Political Party was born in 1874. It was closely associated with the labor union movement and demanded increased government spending and taxation to redistribute wealth. Many of these ideas were remnants of the French Revolution. They were also an outgrowth of, growth of Thomas Paine's ideas as expressed in his widely circulated and influential books such as The Rights of Men and Agrarian Justice. In the midst of this political debate, long before the communist experiment proved to be an abysmal failure, that brought poverty and slavery instead of equality and utopia. A 19th century Christian author, Ellen White, presciently noted, it was not the purpose of God that poverty should ever leave the world. The ranks of society were never to be equalized for the diversity of conditions which characterizes our race is one of the means by which God is designed to prove and develop character. Many have urged with great enthusiasm that all men should have an equal share in the temporal blessings of God, but this was not the purpose of the Creator. 
The author here is describing social justice before the term social justice was popular. Christ has said that we shall have the poor always with us. The poor as well as the rich are the purchase of his blood. And among his professed followers, in most cases, the former serve him with a singleness of purpose while the latter are constantly fastening their affections on their earthly treasure and Christ is forgotten. Jesus ha said that it was harder for the rich to be saved than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And Paul and James echo this. For the rich, the cares of this life and the greed for riches eclipse the glory of the eternal world. It would be the greatest misfortune that has ever befallen mankind if all were to be placed upon an equality in worldly possessions. This philosophy, straight out of the Bible, has been amply demonstrated in every communist country. The great difference between social justice and Christianity can be summarized as the difference between taking and giving. Social justice is based on taking from others while Christianity is based on giving to others. Giving grows out of that positive, health-promoting emotion of love which banishes feelings of covetousness, jealousy, and envy. Taking grows out of the negative emotions of coveting, jealousy, jealous, and envy, which banishes feelings of love and promote anxiety, depression, quarrels, and suicide. Perhaps the most well-known Christian Bible verse is found in John 3.16, Probably most people here know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Christ, the creator and sustainer of the universe, set the example for all Christians when he personally left his palace of wealth, opportunity, and privilege and came to this damaged world to save its dysfunctional people offering them an escape from the character-warping emotions of coveting, envy, jealousy. On this earth, Christ had the hard lot of carpenter. He worked hard for his daily bread, but shared his scanty earthly resources with others in need. When he was abused and mistreated, he trusted in his father, and he also prayed for the forgiveness of his enemies. And this gave him peace, and he offers to exchange our discontent for his peace. Christ fills his followers with his love. And they remain joyous in loss or gain, abundance or scarcity, wealth or poverty. They discover the satisfaction of service to others and sing while burning at the stake for the cause of Christ. They've been lifted from the low emotional intelligence of serving self to the high emotional intelligence of serving God and others. Music